So this is the old worksheet that we used to use when uh, we were uh, we had the in-person lecture. And one of the first things we would do when we start our coverage of uh, Newton's laws and Newton's law problem solving is free, drawing free body diagrams. You've heard me say this is the very first step in the problem, the standard strategy, and it's the most important step. It's the step that takes most creativity, most uh, care, most time, most effort. And um, it, sometimes people um, don't appreciate how important it is because, you know, they think, oh, it's a picture. So I, can, I can ignore pictures. It's a, it's a graphical problem solving tool. So it's important that you draw this picture correctly. So in this question, uh, problem one, free body diagrams, also known as force diagrams, it has a bunch of examples. And uh, I thought I would go through drawing them all. I think we have 25 minutes. That should be enough time to, uh, to have draw all the examples. And these are the kind of um, questions you should be asking to um, to um, to make sure that you are identifying forces correctly. So you've seen the types of force lecture whose whole purpose is to emphasize that in this class, gravitational force is the only force that's not a contact force. So any other force that you are identifying in free body diagram, you should be able to identify what's touching what to exert that force, to push or pull the object, which is you know, force. And gravity is the only force you are allowed to draw where nothing's touching to exert that force. And, um, and I only draw forces. Uh, sometimes you might want to draw axis and acceleration, that sort of stuff. I try to draw them in a distinctly different way so that I don't confuse them from force. And uh, I try to keep my diagram simple, draw a single dot. Don't try to draw forces on the object, figure picture of the object, although uh, it's not the kind of thing I deduct the points for. But my recommendation is draw a separate dot to represent the object. To keep your um, to keep your free body diagram really simple um, and yeah okay so I copied this over to OneNote so let me go over to OneNote and um, start drawing this I've done some of these examples before I'll just uh, do them again and um, and we'll see where it goes it says draw free body diagrams of textbook on a table uh, all right. I'm going to um, make use of the fact that it just said the text table. It didn't ask me to draw the free body diagram of the table. So I'm not going to draw diagram of the table. I have another video where I've done free body diagram of the table and earth. You can look at that. So for textbook on a table, what it would look like is uh, you start out with a dot to indicate the textbook. It's my object. So you think through what forces might be on the text book. So as I think through, you know, imagine a book on a table and, um, well, it's on Earth, so there must be gravitational force on it. And again, that's the one force I'm allowed to draw without identifying anything that's touching the text book. So there's weight or gravity. Once I've drawn that gravitational force, then additional forces become necessary because the way I've drawn this figure, it looks like it's going to be accelerating downward. And I know my textbook on a table is not accelerating downward. So there must be an upward force to counteract the gravity and uh, keep it from accelerating downward. So that's where I realize, oh, it's touching the table. So the table is able to exert a contact force, no more force upward. So that would be my upward normal force uh, from table. And this designation where it's coming from, it's more important when you're identifying, uh, when you have multiple objects in your free body diagram, so you have to identify action, reaction, force pairs. Um, I'm not doing that now. Other than to note that these two are not action, reaction, force pairs. Sometimes uh, people use Newton's third law backward. They uh, somehow focus on that equal and opposite part and um, look for equal and opposite forces to pair them as action reaction pair. You, the way proper way to use Newton's third law is the other way around. 
you first identify which are action reaction force pairs, and then you use that fact to identify those two pairs as having two pair of forces as having um, having the uh, same magnitude. So, uh, so you know, this diagram is really simple. Gravity, there must be no force, so it doesn't accelerate. Acceleration is true. Okay, um, the number two, it says a parachutist continuing a fall at a terminal velocity. I guess it's saying continuing so that you don't think about parachutist uh, just uh, having jumped out. It's someone who jumped out, having da moving downward for a long time, and is currently at terminal velocity. This is an important part. Because the terminal velocity, that actually gives you a piece of information that says the velocity is constant, so the acceleration must be zero. So when I draw this, when I draw free body diagram for this parachutist, again, I indicate the parachutist with a single dot, no need to get fancy, no need to complicate the diagram. Um, there's going to be gravity on the parachutist. There's always going to be gravity whenever you are dealing with someone or something that's near Earth. So, okay, gravity. Once I've done gravity, then I know this. Um, this cannot be the complete free body diagram because I know acceleration of this parachutist is zero from what I've said before. So there must be some kind of an upward force to balance out the force and make the net force come out to zero. And um, this is where you might have to think about it for a bit to figure out what this force is. I guess the easiest way to say it is that it's the drag of force. It's the, um, it's the force that, uh, force from air <laughs> that, uh, slowing the parachutist down so that um, the, the, the acceleration that might have been minus g is not minus g, just a zero. Um, and uh, in this class, we don't really deal with the drag forces a lot. I know your textbook, well, because I know your textbook covers drag force and has formula for it and all that stuff, uh, you won't really see me cover a drag force. It's the kind of thing that uh, by the time you have to deal with it, you'll learn so much more about it than I can teach you in this semester. So, uh, But we will, uh, we will acknowledge their existence uh, in times when we have to. So uh, drag force. That's what causes parachutists to fall at um, a constant speed. Okay, uh, the next example. A uh, figure skater standing still on ice. Oh, that's easy, I think. Standing still part especially makes things easy because that tells me, oh, the figure skater's velocity is zero. So they are accelerating. And since it stays at zero velocity, uh, their acceleration must be zero as well. Um, so uh, the free body diagram of figure skater will look like. Um, actually, I see four that's related to three. So uh, I, I think I can do three here. And then um, I'll draw four separately. <laughs> Sorry, I'm <laughs> all confusing myself. Okay, three, figure skater. So this is figure scalar at rest and remaining at rest. So I think about the situation, imagine someone who's standing on ice. Um, and well, there's going to be gravity. And by the way, you will see me do this often. I'll draw gravity first because there's always gravity. There's almost always gravity. So it's the very first force that you can always draw. And all the other forces that you might draw, it's uh, designed to enforce a particular uh, particular uh, constraint, a particular requirement. So here the requirement is that acceleration of the figure skater must be zero. So there must be some kind of upward force. I see a question. Question. Uh, what does the W stand for? W stands for weight. Okay. Yeah. So uh, sometimes, you know, uh, I, I in other uh, problem solving scenarios, I might say mg for mass times gravity. Um, I, I didn't want to bring in additional quantities yet. So there must be an upward force on the figure skater. And um, so you think of it, okay, someone's standing on ice, um, what kind of upward force could there be? Um, so 
uh, well, the ice is touching the figure skater, so there must be normal force that's uh, supporting the figure skater's position. So normal force from ice. Again, this uh, identification is more important if you're drawing a free body diagram for ice because then you have to draw a reaction force on the ice. Let me do the last one, that uh, the uh, figure skater skating for the ice in a straight line at a constant speed. Oh, <laughs> so this is a long way to say acceleration of the figure skater is zero. Um, so that sounds like uh, then I should be drawing um, for figure skater skating. I guess the downward and upward forces are the same. They're, they're nothing's changed that would make me think any of those should change. There's still gravity, there's still normal force. And I guess the decision you have to make is whether this is complete. You know, acceleration of the figure skater is zero. You are done, no other forces. If you end it there, especially it's because it's a figure skater in on ice, I might say, yeah, this is approximately correct. You know, ice uh, treated as frictionless, so figure skaters could be sliding on it with a negligible force one way or the other. Um, there, um, that's one way of approaching it, and I would say, you know, this um, this way of drawing it, correct. Uh, there, there's um, no reason to say it's incorrect. Now, having said that, I can imagine someone who's spent more time thinking about this scenario drawing um, two, um, two additional forces. Uh, one, if you study this worrying about frictional forces and whatever, then you might draw some kind of a drag force. Uh, maybe there's, a, there's a enough air resistance, or maybe you have to worry about uh, friction with the ice. Once you've drawn this force, then you have to draw one additional force. Uh, I'm going to just label it as force forward. This is the force that might be between the skate and the ice as the sca figure skater pushes backward on the ice. This force must exist so that horizontally the forces are balanced. And I would say someone, to someone who drew a figure like this, it's uh, also correct. And this is the part, I guess, that uh, goes to uh, creativity and consideration and thought. Um, so, you know, if you want to kind of get it done as quickly as possible and not think about these forces, it's fine. Um, <laughs> as far as your uh, final acceleration being zero, you got it right. And the question was worded in such a way that it was trying to prevent you from introducing horizontal forces. Totally fine. For someone who's trying to think more outside the box, trying to bring in additional things like a drag and air resistance, you have to be sure to also bring in things that balance those out. Because what doesn't change is that acceleration is still zero. So you still have to have zero acceleration. So, oh, do you notice any features common in these free body diagrams? Uh, I think I was starting to notice that, in, that the acceleration is equal to zero. Uh, which means that net force is equal to zero, which means all forces balance each other out. All forces balance. Okay, so uh, let's look at next uh, two set of questions. I think I have 12 minutes. Uh, that's probably enough. Uh -huh. um, so this uh, scenario, it says, through free body diagrams of um, a person in elevator as the elevator accelerates upward. Ah, so um, so the person that I'm drawing, I need to identify there being an upward acceleration. So the forces that I draw has to be consistent with this upward acceleration. So uh, I do the same thing I did in the previous question. I start with the gravity. Uh, there's weight of the person pulling him or she, him or her, or them, <laughs> pushing, pulling the person down. <laughs> there's gravity pulling the person down. 
And uh, if anything, this is in the wrong direction because I need to identify upward acceleration. So um, you think of through the same thing, you know, person is standing on some platform, the platform is accelerating upward. So there must be a, some sort of push from the platform to the person. That's the normal force. So there must be a normal force upward. And I am going to deliberately draw it to be longer than the gravity because what I want to try to indicate is that net force will be upward, to be consistent with the upward acceleration for an elevator that's uh, uh, accelerating upward. Um, so that's one. Uh, for two, a person in elevator as the elevator accelerates downward. Okay. Now, uh, acceler elevator accelerating downward, it could be an elevator that's moving downward and accelerating downward. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be. So it could be an elevator that's moving upward, but slowing down. That would be considered accelerating downward. In any case, the question just gave us that acceleration is downward. And those other potential complications in which direction this accelerator is moving, it doesn't change anything. So um, for this person, uh, the, there's still gravity. There's always gravity. That's why I like to draw gravity first. And this time I need to draw that upward support normal force in such a way that the whole thing is moving, uh, accelerating downward. So the normal force must be less than weight. So I'll draw it slightly shorter than the weight. So this is the normal force, slightly less so that the net force will be pointed downward in a direction consistent with the acceleration. Finally, oh, noticing the typo there. No way to fix it. <laughs> um, a person sitting in a car as the car accelerates forward. Okay, um, so I think I've drawn a prettier picture of this elsewhere. So let me just uh, do a quick and dirty version of the picture and let this one stand as it is. Um, so, three. So, there's a. Oh, wait, I don't even have to draw any picture. I mean, oh, but let me draw a picture just so that I have something in mind. Um, so, there's a seat, and there's someone who's just, uh, sitting in that seat. And this car is going to be accelerating forward that way. So, I'm just drawing the person, not the seat, not other things, just the person. So, um, again, person. Well, there's always going to be gravity. So let's draw gravity, weight, pulling the person downward. But the person isn't, vertically, the person isn't accelerating at all. So this weight must be balanced out. So let me draw normal force upward to balance out that weight. Now, as I stare at this, this is not a complete uh, picture, a complete drawing of the free body diagram because I need to have acceleration going that way. So somehow I need to have a force going this way. And it's a matter of identifying that force. Where could that force be coming from? I know it can't be gravity because I already drew gravity and that wasn't it. <laughs> um, it must be some other force. So you think through and um, you can uh, identify two different sources of that force. It could be coming from friction with the bottom of the seat. Uh, imagine you're standing on a, a BART and as it's uh, accelerating forward, you somehow stay in place without holding on to anything. That would be the kind of the friction. Um, that's one type of force that could be on the person or more likely for someone who is uh, sitting in a car, it could be a force from the back seat. Maybe they are leaning uh, on the back seat and the back seat is pushing them forward. So, uh, so let me label it for that scenario. So this is forward the force, I'll say forward force and uh, from back seat or from seat back, from back of the seat, not uh, seat that is in the back. <laughs> so, so yeah, in this case, in order to have this horizontal acceleration, you need this horizontal force and you need to uh, associate it with something that's touching the person. Because again, the, other than gravity, every single force you will see in this class are contact forces. 
So uh, how are these free body diagrams, <laughs> diagrams different from those in A? Well, there's an acceleration. So I'll say acceleration is no longer zero. There's a non-zero acceleration that your free body diagram has to be consistent with. Okay, five more minutes. Um, yeah, I think I can uh, do this question. Consider an astronaut in International Space Station floating in the middle of the room. Uh, what forces would you identify in a free body diagram for the astronaut? It's an interesting question. Um, I can imagine someone answering it this way, you know, considering the picture locally. You know, you have a space station or something that looks like a satellite. And there's uh, someone who's inside here who is floating in there. And you look at that person, you think, you think, oh, their velocity is zero, their acceleration is zero, and um, they are just floating, so there can be no contact force on them. So I can imagine someone from the, all those things concluding a free body diagram, nothing, just the astronaut, no forces. I can imagine someone concluding uh, this uh, picture, having this picture in the end. And um, as I was pointing out in the back and forth with the perplexity, um, this, there's a sense in which this can be considered correct. So if you are considering this picture locally, then sure, locally, yeah, that locally this is how it appears. and. Um, and and I wouldn't uh, I, I wouldn't really um, um, fight you too hard <laughs> on saying that this is correct. Uh, but I want you to see more than locally because a lot of the things we do in this class it happens around the Earth. So I don't want you to just ignore Earth whenever we mention space. You know, Earth might still be nearby. And especially with the International Space Station, which is in what we call low Earth orbit, uh, it's, it's near Earth, uh, indisputably. So what you have to have in mind is you have Earth here. And the space station is orbiting Earth. And by orbiting, we mean it's going in a circle around Earth or something that's circular-ish. Its orbit might be elliptical. Um, and whenever something is moving in a circle, this is what you have to realize. That something that's moving in a circle, its velocity is constantly changing. You know, I drew these two velocities. Even if they have the same magnitude, when you compare VI with VF, it'll have changed the direction. So there's the delta V. If there's a change in velocity, there is acceleration. There is centripetal acceleration on the, on the satellite. And if the astronaut is floating relative to the satellite, there, when you look at the astronaut, there must be centripetal acceleration for the astronaut as well. So when you look at this picture, um, so locally, it's correct that um, that it's uh, at zero velocity and not accelerating. But let me just copy it over. So locally, I was saying I wouldn't fight you too hard on whether this is correct or not. But in the picture that includes Earth. So if uh, you think of Earth in reference frame, it's uh, no longer true that either the velocity is zero or acceleration is zero. In fact, the velocity will be orbital velocity. Something pretty fast. I forget how large. It's some like uh, kilometers per second kind of speed. Um, yeah, it's pretty fast. If uh, the space station entered the atmosphere at the speed, it would just burn up. And with that speed, it's going to have this centripetal acceleration. So the acceleration, instead of being zero, it'll be given by that centripetal acceleration formula that you used when we did the kinematics, V squared over R. And um, it'll be, um, so in this snapshot, it'll be pointed that way. So there should be centripetal force that's pointed 
uh, in the way I drew for this uh, snapshot. For this, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, net force zero, that won't be correct anymore. You have to have this, this net force that matches with uh, this uh, centripetal acceleration. And you have to, have to identify where does that force come from. And that force comes from gravity, weight. And uh, we will cover Newton's law of gravitation, Newton's law of universal gravitation in a um, couple months. <laughs> and uh, once we do, then you will have this formula for gravitational force that's applicable to all scenarios. Some constant times product of masses of the two things interacting divided by distance squared. Uh, we haven't covered it. Um, so the formula we have been using for weight, mass times g, it's not going to act um, um, strictly correctly in this picture. But one thing that you will see is that when you, one thing that you will see when you use this formula is that um, the gravitational force on astronaut is actually pretty similar to gravitational force on us. It's only like 10% less. So when we say microgravity or gravity disappears, we are really describing this picture, the local picture, where locally it appears as though gravity has disappeared. Then depending on what you're doing, that description might be fine, not a big problem, um, but you should <laughs> always know how to re-describe the scenario in a way that includes the Earth in the, into the reference frame. Um, you should uh, be uh, familiar with how to do that as well. So, you know, which of these two free body diagrams are correct? Depends on the scenario. Uh, if you want you to figure out what support force is needed for the astronaut, this is perfectly fine. If you want you to answer some gravity question, then you do need this, the one on the right.